How many people right now in this moment are currently displaced, seeking refuge in another land, seeking employment in another land due to lack of options in their own, seeking asylum from dangerous conditions, or seeking a better life for their families after the resources of their home had been stolen by wealthy entities? In total, there are about 1 billion migrants throughout the world. Of this billion, there are 80 million who are forcibly displaced, including 45.7 million people who are internally displaced within their own countries. Of these displaced people, approximately 45% are under the age of 18. If the world population is approximately 7 billion, then one out of every seven human beings on Earth is presently a migrant. For context, there are more migrants on Earth than the populations of the United States, Canada, Germany, the United Kingdom, France, Italy, and Japan combined. Migrants is a broad classification for people who are living and working outside of their nation of origin. This can include everything from migrant laborers seeking either temporary or permanent employment if there is little to none in their home, to refugees from war, famine, changing climate, cartels, and other disastrous, dangerous conditions. Migration generally flows from poor nations to richer nations, often prompting a nativist and xenophobic posture from the citizens of the rich nations. However, many of the conditions that lead to migration from poor nations to rich nations have to do with circumstances created by the rich nations in the first place. Unequal trade deals, debt from the former colonial period, wars waged by rich nations on poor nations, environmental disasters attributed to climate change primarily caused by industry in rich nations, and other circumstances that lead to people abandoning their homes in search of a better life. In other words, rich nations exploit poor nations and create conditions in which those living in poor nations need to seek refuge elsewhere. Then, rich nations set the terms in which poor migrants and refugees can enter, effectively laying responsibility on the people of the poor nations for circumstances created by the rich nations. Finally, rich nations do not accept responsibility for the conditions that lead to migration and use nativist political propaganda, news media, and other forms of manufactured resentment to maintain this relationship and this system. According to philosophers such as Jean Baudin and sociologists like Max Weber, a state is a territory in which a monopoly of violence has been claimed. Violence is physical force, physical control, or a threat of either. We, as residents of the state, are not permitted access to violence, whereas agents of the state, be they politicians or law enforcement, either control the terms in which violence can be used or perform the violence directly. The border of a state is used to physically enforce the terms of who is and is not allowed within the state. Thus, a border is not only potentially violent in the more visual, explicit, and instantly recognizable form of this definition. Instead, a border itself is a form of violence. This is compounded by the fact that activities decided within the state that affect people outside the state through foreign policy are also violent. Politicians, pundits, and other public figures direct our attention to violence at the borders to justify this resentment. But the existence of borders is a far greater source of violence. National borders partition the world and control migration to serve the economic interests of the few. How did this happen? Was it always this way? And if not, does that mean that some other system, some other way of life, can work out better for all of us? Precisely how humankind transformed from nomadic to sedentary life is speculated and debated among anthropologists, but some matters are clear enough. Sedentary agriculture began around 10,000 BCE, which eventually led to early states around 3,000 BCE in Egypt and Mesopotamia. These early states had no boundaries or clear territory. Although scholars debate the finer points, one theory of state development is that the early states were created to protect the private property of the few, as agriculture led to early stratified economic classes. 
It was not human nature that created inequality if states did not develop for thousands of years. Rather, it was circumstance and environment. According to Rhys Jones, author of Violent Borders, modern histories of states emphasize the positive attributes of state expansion. The positive version of state expansion ignores the significant role of coercion in state making. States extracted taxes that were used to pay for armies, administration, and large building projects. States were also incubators for disease, with a dense population, monoculture crops, and the pests that follow. Most states practiced slavery and relied on forced labor and military conscription for territorial expansion. States emerged by enclosing land and resources and by limiting the movement of other people. This enclosure was performed by those who gained and inherited enough power to do so. This continued throughout the centuries. In 16th century Europe, during the emergence of capitalism, lords began to enclose common land and convert it into territory and private property. In short, over the course of human history, greater wealth was accumulated and concentrated among the few, and greater restrictions on movement and land were established to maintain that wealth and prevent the masses from having control of their own lives. Also in the 16th century, Europe was still recovering from the Black Plague. Massive population loss stunted development of the continent by annihilating their labor force and weakening their institutions. However, some European nations still maintained their militaries and sought to rebuild through colonization and exploitation of more vulnerable nations. Much in the way that Europe suffered from depopulation in the 14th and 15th centuries, Africa, North America, and South America were depopulated by European conquerors in the 16th century through the 19th century, through slavery, executions, warfare, and control from afar, all in the service of stripping resources. Colonialism is a policy of conquering, stealing, and controlling a new territory, transforming indigenous populations into second-class citizens or slaves. This eventually enriched much of Europe. Inexpensive labor or slave labor throughout the history of colonialism in the Americas and Africa provided the capital for the Industrial Revolution in Europe and eventually the United States. This allowed richer nations to develop and modernize by the 19th century and prevented poor nations from doing the same for a long time. According to Teresa Hayter, author of Open Borders, The Case Against Immigration Controls, the wealth of Europe and other industrialized countries was built from the 16th century onwards through the exploitation of the natural resources and peoples of the rest of the world. Europeans used the labor of conquered peoples to produce raw materials and primary products for consumption in Europe, and they destroyed the industries of the more advanced civilizations they encountered in their imperial expansion. They then embarked on their own industrialization and they protected their new industries through quotas, tariffs, and prohibitions. Once they had established their dominance, they advocated free trade. Following the end of the colonization period, an unequal relationship between rich nations and poor nations had been established through trade deals that disadvantaged the latter. This unequal relationship was also solidified through debt from colonization that poor nations had to pay off themselves, despite being debts created and enforced by the colonizers. These debts give rich nations the power to impose policies on poor nations, such as monopolies by foreign corporations, and influence on internal policy that advantages the rich nations. This unequal economic relationship works in tandem with stricter immigration restrictions and tightened security at borders. Once rich nations could control poor nations through economics, rich nations then had to find a way to prevent migrants and refugees from simply abandoning their annihilated homeland and living, ironically, in the nation that was responsible. Restrictions on entering nations, particularly rich nations, rose in tandem with trade deals that negatively affected poor nations. According to Harshawalia, author of Undoing Border Imperialism, a salient example of the impact of capitalist mobility on migration trends in North America is the effects of the 1994 North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, which has displaced millions of Mexicans and the parallel fortification of the U.S.-Mexican border against migrants.
Under NAFTA, the Mexican government was forced to eliminate subsidies to corn while corn produced in the United States remained subsidized, thus making U.S. corn cheaper to buy inside Mexico than Mexican corn. As a result, over 15 million Mexicans were forced into poverty, and 1.5 million farmers who lost their farms migrated to the United States to work in low-wage sectors. The maintenance of poverty by rich nations forces migrants in poor nations to travel to the very nations that kept them in poverty. Migrant laborers suffer from abuse and exploitation. This includes criminally low wages and dangerous occupations. Because of their tenuous legal status, migrant laborers are unlikely to raise serious grievances with their employers, or they may face dismissal or even deportation. In summary, rich nations keep some nations in relative poverty through unequal trade deals and debt arrangements. Then rich nations welcome some migrants from poor nations to exploit them for inexpensive labor. Rich nations also exclude most migrants to maintain control of the economy and to force most in poor nations to continue to provide inexpensive goods to import into their nations. On its face, this is obviously inhumane, but propaganda changes the narrative from a conflict between rich nations and poor nations to a conflict between what is legal and what is illegal. It is legal to impose restrictions on borders. It is legal to maintain poverty in poor nations through trade and debt. It is illegal to flee from these conditions and immediately join the workforce of a wealthy nation. Rich nations make the rules to disadvantage poor nations and then chastise poor nations and poor migrants for not following them. No matter how little power migrants have, and no matter how badly they are treated, the blame is always shifted on them instead of those who have created these conditions in the first place. Legal immigration good. Illegal immigration bad. However, the legal immigration system is prohibitively costly and time-consuming for those facing immediate hardship. Legal immigration often takes years, work visas have many restrictions, and application is no guarantee of entry, ever. The legal immigration apparatus in a rich nation like the United States is a maze of caps on nations and limitations on who may and may not cross the border. If the legal option is not available, the illegal option will be taken. If the legal option is not immediate, but the need is immediate, the illegal option will be taken. It is simply inhumane to expect people whose lives have been destroyed by poverty to wait for years, sometimes decades, before trying to make a better life for themselves and their families. It is a position of incredible privilege and hypocrisy considering why they are impoverished to begin with. Those who leave the borders of their own nation due to emergency hardships and displacement rather than purely to seek employment are more commonly called refugees. Civilians in nations that are suffering from a bombing campaign from a richer nation with economic interests in the region often find themselves without homes. This can happen directly, meaning their physical house or building can be destroyed in the conflict, or indirectly due to the nation's loss of infrastructure and institutions. Refugees count in the millions, and these various refugee crises originating in poor nations can be directly tied to the intervention of rich nations. For example, the United States' involvement in Afghanistan from 2001 until today. More than 2.5 million people are estimated to be living in a prolonged internal displacement, while more than 2.7 million people have been forced to leave the nation to live in Iran, Pakistan, or various nations in Europe. As of last year, 9.2 million Iraqis are either internally displaced or refugees abroad. Internal displacement means that people are resettled within the same nation but live in camps and temporary housing indefinitely, partly due to limits on rich nations accepting refugees. In addition to war refugees, there are also climate refugees, people displaced due to changing environment or environmental disasters. According to the United Nations Refugee Agency, the impacts of climate change are numerous. Limited natural resources, such as drinking water, are likely to become even scarcer in many parts of the world. 
crops and livestock struggle to survive in climate change hotspots where conditions become too hot and dry or too cold and wet, threatening livelihoods and exacerbating food insecurity. People are trying to adapt to the changing environment, but many are being forcibly displaced from their homes by the effects of climate change and disasters, or are relocating in order to survive. What the UN does not say, however, is that climate change is primarily caused by rich nations. Remember those seven nations from the beginning? That's the G7, a collective of nations that constitute 58% of the world's net wealth. Not surprisingly, among the top 20 contributors to climate change, all seven of these nations are within the top 20, not to mention other heavily industrialized nations like China, Russia, Australia, and others. With the exception of Brazil, there are no South American nations on this list. Africa contributes relatively little to climate change. The rich nations of the world, however, destroy the climate and create millions of climate refugees. Due to the changing climate, some estimate that there will be between 150 and 200 million climate change refugees by the year 2050. Rich nations only take a fraction of these refugees in total. Many refugees are turned away from all nations, either indefinitely seeking a home or indefinitely displaced internally in the aforementioned camps. The refugees are not simply divided up among all the nations. Many of them are simply trapped. Furthermore, the numbers don't add up in any meaningful way to justify the actions of the rich nations. For example, the United States sets refugee admission caps. According to Pew Research, in 2019, the administration set a refugee ceiling of only 30,000, and in 2020, the ceiling was set to only 18,000. This might sound like a lot of people, but not when you take into account that there are 80 million refugees worldwide. 18,000 is 0.02% of 80 million, a fraction of a fraction of a percent. Defenders of rich nations might also argue that the very richest nations are still leading the way in taking in these refugees, but that is not actually true either. Of the G7, only Germany is among the top five host nations for refugees, below Pakistan and Uganda. No matter how desperate the refugees are, and no matter how responsible the rich nations are for their circumstances and hardships, many of the citizens of the rich nations will still buy into the idea that refugees are troublemakers at best and dangerous criminals at worst. Politicians demonize immigrants, and the press, particularly the conservative press, uncritically repeats their accusations or uses the controversy to their own benefit. Again from Open Borders, the criminalization of refugees and migrants has the effect, deliberately or otherwise, of creating a group of people who are subject to extreme forms of exploitation as illegal workers. It also feeds racist prejudice. The government uses language about refugees which differs little from that of the gutter press. It is then a small step encouraged at times by the selective release of crime statistics and the results of government investigations into international crime rings to accuse asylum seekers of cheating on social security, scavenging tube tickets, and other rackets. So, with all of this in mind, about borders and refugees and immigrants, does the world have to be this way? It was not always this way. In the United States, for example, between 1892 and 1954, almost 12 million immigrants were processed through the immigration station on Ellis Island. It was a golden era of immigration, people coming from all over the world to start again in the United States, and the nation largely benefited from this mass of immigrants. However, between these years, the number of annual immigrants reduced every time anti-immigration legislation was passed. Quotas were created, entire nations and regions were restricted or outright banned. Ellis Island is now a museum. Everything has changed. So, how do we solve the border crisis? Well, there are two lines of thinking. One is solving the circumstances that lead to undocumented migrant labor and refugees in the first place, and the second is solving borders as violence specifically by abolishing immigration restrictions. In truth, both solutions must occur in tandem. The abolition of restrictions and the reorganization of the entire world cannot happen through one reform or one change. Interventionist wars of choice must end or else war refugees will always exist. Greater steps towards curtailing climate change must also be enacted, 
Climate scientists have their recommendations, and for reasons of the profit motive, they are not always followed. All trade deals must be immediately renegotiated to be more equitable. All colonial debt must be immediately wiped out. The ratio of aid going into poor nations must be made higher than what is extracted. Believe it or not, for all the talk of rich nations providing foreign aid, that is currently not the case. They take more than they give. We can't just keep building bigger and bigger walls. They don't work, and they don't actually solve inhumane conditions. They only keep inhumane conditions out of sight. Now, what about the borders themselves? Borders tear families apart, separating children from their parents, sometimes permanently. Borders force migrants and refugees into the hands of unscrupulous or outright criminal agents, subjecting them to long periods of arbitrary detention, hunger, isolation, racial harassment, and in some cases, forced medical procedures. The crowding of migrants in camps often leads to disease and epidemics. Even those who are eventually released suffer trauma from the experience. This is particularly true of children. The common counterargument to all of this is invariably, well, if they don't want to be tortured and have their children stolen from them, they shouldn't have come here. But this argument falls apart under scrutiny. Besides who is at fault for creating the circumstances in the first place, there is no moral justification for violating the human rights of others and no legal justification for the frequent violations of international law that are ignored at borders. Thus, the whole it's your fault for crossing the border argument and the related it's not our problem argument absolutely crumble when a broader view of events is allowed. It is unreasonable to expect someone to continue living in their home if it's on fire. Another argument against abolition of restrictions is that existing jobs would be threatened and that immigrants are a tremendous strain on welfare. However, studies consistently show that is not true. Economic migration is only perpetuated because there is economic demand across the border. A counterargument to this is that these circumstances may change if, say, only the United States loosens or abolishes its border restrictions. But if this action is done in tandem with other rich nations like the rest of the G7 or some European Union members, the influx of migrants would not land solely on the borders of the U.S., other arguments against abolishing immigration restrictions come from irrational fear. Politicians and conservative pundits beat the drum of nativism, claiming that migrants and refugees are dangerous. This has been especially common in the United States and the United Kingdom in recent years. However, studies have shown that immigrants are less likely to commit crimes than those born in the U.S., Nativist sentiment also includes the charge that allowing more immigrants would change the culture of the nation, but this is merely a dog whistle for race. A nakedly bigoted argument is inherently worthless. So, what would a world with limited or no immigration restrictions even look like? Those in favor of this abolition vary in their overall political philosophies, meaning whether or not their end goal is the abolition of the state and borders altogether. But a common proposal, one which could be arranged within our current system, is this. Immigrants, whether migrant workers or refugees, would pass through customs checkpoints, and migration would no longer be prevented by border patrol. Illegal immigration would be a label only for unwelcome terrorists, those carrying contraband, and others deemed to be planning immediate harm. Few would be turned away except under these extreme circumstances uncovered during screening. All other migrants and refugees would be given immigration documents. No caps that would limit the amount of migrants. No waiting for years for the system to choose your turn. No arbitrary denials based on education, skills, or status of family across the border. Nothing like that. With practically no immigration restrictions and with almost everyone getting documented, there would be no need for dangerous coyote crossings or climbing over walls. Migrants risk their lives because they assume, often correctly, that they will be turned away at the border. If they are no longer turned away, the coyote crossings would dry up, leaving what remains of border patrol to focus on actual problems. That is not to say that abolition of immigration restrictions would have no problems, only that this system would produce fewer problems and would be significantly more humane. This is not some utopian dream, because the world used to be this way, and it can be this way again.